Thank you, Leanne, for showing that video. That absolutely puts no pressure on me whatsoever <laughs> right before <laughs> that amazing video. But as, as Leanne said, the purpose of my talk today is to address this, this perception of the relationship between science and religion, that there's this belief that the two are at odds with one another and that we do have to choose between the two. And I thought I'd start my talk with a, a popular image that I think most of you have seen at, at some point. And uh, I'll start with one of these images. It's usually called the Jesus fish or ichthys in Greek. And we see these on magnets and uh, on cars and t-shirts. And it's a symbol of the Christian faith. Very often it's just an outline or it can have the word Jesus in it or even a little cross for the eye. And Christians proudly put these, these magnets on their car to let others know of what their beliefs are. Well, about a few years ago, we started seeing derivatives of the Jesus fish that we, we call the, often call the Darwin fish. And I know everyone ha has seen these. They almost always have little feet on them and sometimes have the word Darwin or evolve uh, in there. I've seen those with, with feathers and fins and all kinds of uh, evolutionary changes. And these are usually put on cars of people that, that have rejected traditional religious teachings and have embraced uh, reason or, or science. And so we, we have these two opposing images, very simple, but they represent hundreds of years of, of fierce animosity between these two groups. And, and every once in a while, topics like evolution or global climate change, or now we've seen recent years, uh, vaccine safety, seems to reignite uh, the, this seeming hatred between the two groups. And uh, there was another breed of these little symbols that makes me chuckle every time I, I see them. Of, uh, I've named them kind of fighting fish that, that actually shows the two fighting with one another. And on the left, you see the, uh, the, the, the Jesus fish eating the Darwin fish. Um, again, illustrating that, that the Christian faith is you know, more powerful than, than science. And then on the right, uh, I, did, I did trace that. It, it took me like four hours to trace that, but I, I did create it, of a T-Rex eating the Jesus fish, again, from the other side, to show that, that reason uh, is, is, is more powerful than religion. So, and that's really getting at the, the gist of, of my, my goal today, is, is to dispel this myth that um, the two have to be at odds. And, and about a year ago, one of my buddies forwarded me an image that I, I tend to, to like more, and I actually sparked uh, a book uh, not too long after it was created. It's called Kissing Fish, and it shows the Jesus fish and the Darwin fish uh, in, in harmony. The little hearts uh, show that they're in love with one another. And, and this was created by someone that, that wished to portray that the two can be in harmony, that the two are not mutually exclusive entities that, that have to be at odds with one another. And again, that, that's my goal for the day, is to dispel this myth that you have to choose. And so before I really get into uh, my, my full-on beliefs on this, it's important for you to have a, a basic idea of where I'm coming from. Well, growing up, I, I grew up in a Christian home from the time I was uh, five or six. I was attending my local Baptist church, and uh, like any good Baptist, we didn't go to church just on Sundays. We were there Wednesdays and sometimes another day of, uh, of the week. I read my Bible every day and had finished the Bible several times by my 10th birthday. I was baptized relatively early on uh, in life, and I continued to be a devout Christian all the way through the middle of uh, my high school years. At the same time, my childhood was filled with one of, of wonder for the natural world. Uh, I know it may be shocking to many of you, my, my students especially, that I was, I was kind of a nerd as a kid. Um, <laughs> I, at one point, I had the nerd trifecta of equipment. I had the microscope, the chemistry set, and the electronics set, while my brother had the football and basketball. and, and uh, all the athletic equipment. Uh, but I really, I love science. I, I loved asking questions and exploring the world around me. And that, that passion for science only grew the older I got, again, heading into my, my high school years. Well, about 11th grade, I, I found that I started to kind of diverge away from, from my faith. And there was nothing definite that occurred that caused me to walk away from my faith. It was really just the busyness that an older high school student gets with my studies. And I, I began a job that caused me to have to work on Sundays. And so by the time I, I fin went into college and ultimately entered into graduate school, in my PhD program in microbiology, I had completely walked away uh, from my faith. I had stopped attending church. I hadn't picked up a Bible in years. And my first few years of grad school were, were some of the 
uh, intellectually most fruitful years of my life. I uh, was learning new molecular techniques every day and, and applying them to discover the world. And uh, I was just uh, fascinated by this concept that I could use uh, these techniques to discover something that no one had ever thought of before. And I can ask questions that no one had ever asked. And it really just continued to ignite my, my, my passion for science. But, and so if I, if I stop my talk right here, you would think that I, I had made a choice, that I had chosen science and reason over my faith. But something strange happened in about my third year of grad school. The, the in, intense scientific training that I was receiving ignited very powerfully a, a curiosity that I'd always, in, uh, always had inside of me. And it caused me to start asking questions, big questions, like what is my purpose in the world? Uh, how do I attain inner peace? What happens to me after I die? And I wrestled with these questions for, for months, uh, going on websites, looking for answers, and I realized I, I just didn't have the tools necessary to, to address these questions. And so there I was, about 23, 24 years old, back in church for the first time in about seven years. And I've been a devout Christian ever since then. So it's kind of strange that uh, it took science to lead me back to, to God. That it was that, 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 that search for knowledge uh, led me to, to seek uh, a, a higher knowledge, so to speak. So th let's get back to the original question. How do I reconcile the two? How do I reconcile my, my strong faith with my, my passion for science? Well, I think the answer lies is very simple, is that I don't see the two as competitors. So let's start with science. Uh, everyone knows generally you've all had a, a biology class in high school and, and chemistry classes. But science I see in very simplistic terms as, as a methodology. It's a tool that we use to systematically answer questions and solve problems. Science has given us the ability to defend ourselves against infectious disease. It's allowed us to see uh, the intricacies of a single cell and, and ultimately explore our, our uh, outer space, our galaxy. However, like any tool, science does have limitations. And one of the major limitations that science has, should be up here, is that science is limited by the technology of, of the day. So I, I think a good example of this, being a microbiologist, of course I was going to use a, a microscope example. If you look at the early microscopes of the 16th and 17th centuries, they were relatively crude by, by today's standards. They were basically just slightly more powerful magnifying glasses. And so the images that you would get from these microscopes, you could barely see any detail of even large cells. Well, fast forward a couple hundred years, we ha now have microscopes that can see at the atomic level, that can see fractions of a nanometer. And just to show you an example of this, on uh, the left, oh, sorry, I thought that was my laser pointer. Um, on the left, you see a, uh, a picture of Staph aureus. This is the, the famous staph that is what MRSA is. And, and this is taken with a microscope that most Bio 1 students would use. It's called a Brightfield microscope. And you can see all the little purple dots, and those are individual staph uh, cells. On the right is an image taken with a scanning electron microscope, which can take images that are several hundred thousand uh, times zoomed in. And you can see much greater detail in that image. Now, the point I'm making here is that staff was always that detailed. Back in the 16th century, that is what staff looked like. It's just we didn't have the technology at the time to fully appreciate the complexity. And so as technology advances, we will see deeper and deeper into things. So we, we are limited by this technology. Another limitation of science is that it, it, it can never be used to absolutely prove anything. And I know it's going to be something weird to hear because we, in, in I think common culture, you hear statements like science has proven this or science has proven that. Science generates data, and that data can lead us to make conclusions, and we can be very confident in those conclusions. But someone could do an experiment tomorrow that causes me to completely reevaluate what my conclusions are. So you can never really prove anything beyond a shadow of a doubt. A third and final, there are more limitations, a third major limitation to science is that it can not provide answers to aesthetic questions. For instance, why a certain painting is considered beautiful to some, uh, or to me, it's kind of creepy, or her eyes seem to follow you, talk about <laughs> perception. Uh, wherever I go, Mona Lisa is looking at me. So where we can have different opinions, you, you can never do an experiment to prove uh, why you love your child, for instance. And, and the, kind of the topic of my talk, you can never use science to prove or disprove spiritual matters. You're never going to do an experiment that disproves the existence of God. 
We, as I told you, we have a hard enough, hard enough time proving what we can measure. It's certainly not going to be possible to prove what we can't measure. So religion, like science, is a tool. Okay? It, it's a tool that we use to answer questions. It's just the questions that it's, it's targeting are different. These are questions related to the spiritual or the supernatural world, whereas science addresses the measurable natural world. And when used, property, when used properly, religion can provide a person with inner peace it can, in the midst of, of trouble. It can provide meaning to a person's life, and it can spark people to amazing acts of, of generosity and kindness. So, the way I see it, and this is really just a simple diagram, I see science and religion both as tools, different tools, asking different questions, but trying to arrive at the same goal, which is ultimately to find truth. Okay? In, in the case of science, the truth that it's seeking is truth related to the natural world, the natural measurable world, and religion, again, is a tool being used to, to seek truth. It's just truth related to the supernatural world, the spiritual world. So they're like a screwdriver and a hammer. Both great tools, both, both uh, practical, excellent when you use them properly, but pretty much useless and, and, and sometimes dangerous if, if misused. When you use science and religion together and you embrace both, it, it allows you to have a more comprehensive view of, of the world around you. So where does all the animosity come in? And again, I'll use my, my great... Uh, artistic ability in this diagram, I think the, the problem comes when people misuse or purposely misrepresent uh, both tools, whether it be science and religion. And again, I'll give you an example. Uh, religious texts that were written several thousand years ago were never intended to be used as a scientific document. If I want to find the cure for HIV or understand how cancer cells spread from one place to another in a person's body, I probably won't find the answers in the Bible or the Quran. Similarly, science was never intended to invalidate someone's religious beliefs. It was never meant to be used as a, as a weapon to demean or belittle someone for, for their, their belief in God. The, 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 so the problem herein lies is, is not so much that we have these tools, it's the tools just aren't being used properly. It's like taking a hammer and trying to, to, to use it as a screwdriver or vice versa. So where do we go from here? I, I think the, the, the answer is simple. We keep uh, using our minds to, to question our surroundings. We keep an open mind, and, and ultimately, we realize we don't have to choose. Okay? You can have the best of both worlds. You can um, accept what science has to offer and, and trust what hundreds of thousands of hours, I know because I contributed a lot of those hours, to contribute to the, the scientific data and, and trust that data. It's okay to believe that the Earth is billions of years old and that humans have come about from millions of years of evolution. And it's equally okay to believe that God played a role in those events, that God gave us science as a gift to help us better understand uh, the world that he created. So it's okay to believe in a world that we, we, we in God and in, in, in a world that we can't measure and still trust that we can measure. So you can question and still have faith. And I know because I've lived it for the last 15 years, and I haven't arrived on all my answers yet, but I know in having science and religion in my toolbox, I, I hope to find those before I die, hopefully very many years from now. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you.